Good afternoon, and welcome to Current Trends in Hospice Quality Data, presented jointly by the Alliance for Home Health Quality and Innovation and the Visiting Nurse Associations of America. This session is being recorded. This continuing nursing education activity has been approved for one contact hour by the Maryland Nurses Association, an accredited approver of the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. In order to receive your certificate of completion, you will need to attend this program in its entirety and complete the evaluation available in the conference app. Certificates of completion are available at the registration desk. Our faculty has disclosed no financial conflict of interest. A copy of the full disclosure sheet is available on the table outside the room. I'd now like to introduce you to, to, uh, to today's presenters. Chris Ataya joined SHP in 2014 after spending 28 years in executive and consulting positions within the home health and hospice industry. In his role, he is responsible for product development and client relationships to help organizations achieve increased operational and financial performance through use of SHP's industry-leading analytics platform and benchmark data. Prior to SHP, Chris was a CFO at the VNA at Boston and had worked at Partners Healthcare and Home Partners Healthcare at Home as CFO and CEO. He received a BA in Public Health from Tufts University and an MBA from the Graduate School of Management at Boston University concentrating in healthcare finance. Danielle Parati is the Vice President for Quality and Performance Improvement with the Visiting Nurse Associations of America. In partnership with member home health and hospice organizations across the country, she brings innovation to care practices seeking to continuously improve practice and meet evolving patient needs. Dr. Parati specializes in developing shared understanding and mutual goals through the, through the development, dissemination, and application of evidence. Dr. Parati has been a nurse for over 20 years, practicing in hospitals, ambulatory, and home-based care, and medical, surgical, oncology, quality, and leadership roles. Prior to joining VNAA, she led hospice services with the largest provider in Iowa, ensuring end-of-life care across 42 mainly rural counties. She developed and initiated a new specialty role in hospital-based nursing quality, guiding the organization to achieve magnet status. Her doctoral research was an examination of nurse-sensitive outcomes in hospitalized, hospitalized oncology patients. So without further ado, take it away, Chris, or Danielle, whoever. Sorry. Great, thank you very much. Um, actually, we have no more time. He used up all the time, so we, you're welcome to leave now. Um, thank, thank you, that was very kind. Uh, today we're going to be talking about getting ready for HQRP. Uh, you heard about the disclosure statement. We had three real objectives that we wanted to get through today. Um, we wanted to look at the trends and the benchmarks in the uh, hospice item set data as well as CAPS hospice. You know, this is going to be publicly reported starting later this year. And I, we thought it was important to kind of look back a little bit and see, well, how has scores changed over time? Uh, we'll use that to then kind of talk a little bit about what are the opportunities for making improvements in your scores and, and really what's next? You know, we, we read a little bit in the final rule about this new patient assessment. What is that going to look like? And I think we're going to ask you to think about that too because we have an opportunity to work with CMS to kind of help promote what that might be as we go forward. But first, uh, the first agenda item, though, is just setting the stage. And I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background, stuff you probably already know. So I'll go through these slides pretty quickly. When the final rule came out uh, last summer and they talked about HQRP, they said that we were going to have public reporting starting sometime in the spring or the summer. If you didn't meet the submission requirements for either CAPS or HIS, you were uh, potentially going to be penalized up to 2%. Um, and the other thing that was interesting that they came out with, and we kind of been hearing this and see this in some of our indus other industry sectors, is a likely star rating that will be coming out soon. One thing about the, the CAPS hospice data that they talked about, which was different than what we've seen in some of the other sectors, is that they're, only, they're gonna be looking at data across two years worth. So it's not gonna be the one year of data ending in a quarter like they do on the home care side. It's going to be uh, uh, eight quarters rolling average as a part of that. So we thought that that was kind of interesting as a part of it. They also made some changes. If you, if you were tracking what they were doing with CAPS, 
there was going to be actually 11 quality measures that were originally uh, planned to be part of the public reporting. And they have since, they came out in December, and I think it was part of the rule, they talked about eliminating three of those measures, rolling them in, and actually coming out with just six composite measures and two global measures. If you want to see the data, they're actually starting to share that now nationally on, a, on the um, National CAPS survey data set. And if you open up the link, you'll be able to see something that looks like this. This is now publicly available. It's just the national data, but you can see what the scores are. Note that these scores are not that significant. There's no decimal place. It's an integer, and that's how they've been reporting uh, home health caps in the past. So, you, so you're not seeing a lot of detail here at this point, and we wonder what that might look like as they start reporting this summer. Something else we learned with the final rule on another aspect of HQRP is what they were doing with hospice item set. They got rid of the seven-day length of stay requirement. It used to be that they were planning only to report on those over seven days. So that's gone away. The treatment preferences and beliefs and values where that has to be asked no earlier than seven days before the admission. That was something new that came out. Clearly, this new composite measure is part of HIS 2.0, as well as the measure pair. So when hospice visits when death is imminent is going to be a part of that data collection uh, that we're seeing that actually just started, right, on April 1st. How many of you have been submitting the data already? Probably everybody who's a hospice provider. It's a requirement now. And it was this new data collections considerations, the discussion in the final rule about uh, a new patient assessment that was intriguing uh, in terms of what they thought uh, CMS at least proposing where we're going to go. And, and Danielle and I will talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that they might be thinking about and actually getting a, a chance to kind of think about that as we go forward. In terms of the length of stay requirement, I, I did have some data within the national data set that SHP has, and I wanted to just share some of the differences between those that were over seven days and under seven days. And interestingly, if you're, it's under seven days, in many cases, five out of seven of, of the measures actually did better in terms of meeting that process measure. I thought that was kind of interesting. I think CMS realized that and said, wait a second, we don't need to have uh, a separation. If it's a short length of stay, these process measures, these, uh, these are still being conducted. And so, yes, we should be collecting it and reporting on it in that way. This just is a little graphic, and we've got a URL here if you wanted to open it up to just see the differences between some of these measures. That length of service, you can see in red here, it shows that um, the length of service has to be at least seven days. That was the original proposal, and then in the following proposal, they changed that. They also said that they want to have quality hospice episodes as a part of what's going to be part of the measure, which means if there's no admission record but a discharge record, HIS record, they're going to, ex they're going to exclude that, and the vice versa. If there's a discharge record but no admission, they're going to exclude it. So those are the type two and type three episodes that are part of this new exclusion criteria. This is what it looks like. Many of you have seen this now. There's three new uh, data elements that they're collecting uh, as a part of the um, admission data set. Uh, patient zip code, payer. They've removed some skip logic, and they've added a new uh, code for paying um, active problem, identifying yes or no in that example. This is uh, the discharge um, assessment. And there are 14 new items here. So this is the work, right? This is where you have to go and collect the visits and get them all entered in on time. It's funny, we, 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 we build Medicare. Can't they just pull it off of that? Uh, but this is the way they're going to be collecting the data. Uh, those visits that occurred in the final three days and those that occurred in the third to the sixth day before death. So they're collecting this data in order to match um, how you did with um, the visits in the final days of life. So CMS uses the final rule. They use other communications as a way to kind of share with us what, what their thinking is, where they're going. In January of this year, in Baltimore, they had a full-day training program. How many of you attended that or, or went to, to see it? Anybody? wasn't anything remarkably new, but they spent the whole day kind of just reiterating things about what that program for HQRP is going to look like. 
couple things that they noted. First one is now they're saying it's gonna be late summer. Or initially it was gonna be spring this summer, that was in the rule. Now they're saying it's gonna be late summer that we're gonna open up uh, and make the home, the hospice compare website available. They did say that all seven of the HIS, the eight composite and global measures for CAPS are all gonna be reported on the website. But those two new measures, the composite and the, um, the hospice um, uh, item set where hospice visits where death is imminent, that pair won't be incorporated at this time. And we understand why the visits wouldn't be, right? Because we're just starting to collect the data. But the composite was a little puzzling because they could have. They could have started to share what um, that composite would have looked like. And again, they talked about the uh, one to five stars as a part of that. Danielle has regular calls with CMS, and I sat in on a couple of them over the last year. Um, and we were asking them, you know, tell us a little bit more. What is this new um, uh, home care, this hospice compare website going to look like? And so they said, well, we just came out with two new ones in, in December, the IRF um, inpatient rehab as well as the uh, LTAC. Go take a look at that because it's going to look a lot like it. So we, we looked at it and we're like, well, there's this, it's simple, um, but there were no state averages. Are they going to have state averages with hospice? When, how much data are they going to collect? Are they going to go back to when uh, the original CAPS data became available, that first quarter where you just had to supply uh, information for one month in the first quarter of 2015? With other um, uh, CAPS surveys, there's a six-month delay. Is it going to be the same thing with hospice? Or, but they haven't shared that. They, they weren't able to give us that information. We do know from the home care compare that uh, for CAPS, you know, there are no individual questions, so that's probably likely we won't see that. Um, process measures are compared for both state and national as we look at it on the home care side, so does it make sense they would? Well, if they follow that same rule, hopefully. And we also know at this point, uh, 12 months for at least the CAPS, they've already told us it's gonna be 24 months at this point. So that was kind of a quick run through uh, just to kind of get us ready to talk about at least some of the data that we've been able to pull through our SHP uh, database. So this is gonna come from about 1,400 hospices that we have in our database that we collect HIS as well as CAPS hospice data. So this is the first item I wanted to share with you is the CAPS information. This is quarterly data. So it's not 12 months ending, it's the actual quarter and the scores associated with the eight uh, measures, again, the six that are composites and the two that are global. What do you notice about this data? Can you see it? What do you notice about the data? Pretty flat. So this is across you know, uh, seven quarters, and it really hasn't changed all that much. It, are you surprised? If you, again, I, I kind of, I live on both sides of the home care and hospice side, and home care hasn't really changed all that much. But you haven't really had a lot of feedback. You haven't had the need necessarily to kind of push yourself because it hadn't been publicly reported. Interestingly, in value-based purchasing states on the home care side, home health caps are improving faster for the VBP states than the non. So when there's, some, when there's money uh, a tie to it, there tends to be more of a push. But the question is going to be, what's going to be the push as the public and other, um, uh, other groups will start seeing this data? What does that mean to you and to your hospice? This is just a different visual, um, and I just did it just because you might not look at numbers, you might look at graphs, and if you look at the blue, that's overall rating. When you look at the gray, that's recommend hospice again through the same time period. Again, pretty flat. Yeah, so the question is, you know, when you have such high scores, what is it going to mean in terms of the variability? And, and we're actually going to talk about that. And so think about what will be important and what is quality. So we have a couple slides that we're going to actually ask you to think about that. You know, when is, now I, I look at this and I say, let me just go back a slide. You know, treating family members with respect. You got an A minus. 
emotional and re religious support, you get an A minus. You get some Bs here, but frankly, there's some Cs. So some of these measures, getting hospice care training, help for symptoms, you're only doing a C. Is that? The question is, this is second party rating. This isn't the patient. The patient's dead, right? Correct. So we're talking about a family member who may or may not be involved in getting a hospice program. So it's one question for us to answer, two questions for quality. We're not taking some of the extra time you usually do. But I'm still getting down to the assumption of the rater, which is CMS, and how they're going to, your, what, what you've heard about how they're going to star something. Good, and, and I'm going to jump in here, if I may, um, because you, you just skipped about half an hour ahead. But um, it's a really important question, and we, we will loop back a little bit to, to, to this, and we are definitely going to delve into what do we think we know that CMS is going to do. The short version is we're not really sure what we're going to do, so let's talk about what those options might be, and we're, we're going to dig into that. But I really do want to address the point you're making about the patient is dead. I'm just going to be right up front there, right? We're in hospice. We, we're okay with that sentence, right? The patient is dead. The simple reality is that in hospice, we've got to learn to care for the patient and the people who survive. And so the fact that this is coming from a secondary source, that is a, the only voice we have. And so it poses that that added challenge to the caregiver in the home, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute, but it is the critical point in this. As we talk about what is quality in hospice, we're going to have to wrap our brains around that other voice, that other place of information, because it's not going to be the patient telling us anymore. Thank you for that. Thanks, Danielle. So what about uh, the HIS scores? What have we seen there? And this is a representation of two different calendar years. In blue, you see the calendar year 2015. The gray is 2016. And what you see across the board is improvements year over year. So I think as uh, hospices got used to the tool, as they started collecting information, uh, abstracting that information, they, got, they, they did much better. Notice the pain assessment, though, still is lagging, at least compared to those other measures. And one of the things that we found is about 5% of that variance is due to the fact that they didn't fill out all five or more characteristics of that pain assessment. They, they only did one through four in 5% in, in of the cases. In 1% of the cases, they didn't fill out any. So there's a big part of why that is falling a little bit behind. In another view, you can see as we combine this with a composite that across the number of quarters from when HIS started back in July of 2014, we've seen a very good improvement. Again, you know, started slow. That was a pretty low score at 66. But as you can see, the average as of the final quarter in 2016 was 90.4 as the average, so a pretty strong improvement. So I, I said earlier, you know, there were some scores that didn't look so good. I, I wanted to pull out individual questions within the composite that also didn't look good. So these are the lowest ratings uh, that I was able to see that were below, let's say, uh, 80%. And what you'll notice here is there are some scores that are actually Ds that are in the 60s that have the opportunity for hospices, I believe, to work on and actually help improve the overall composite. So if you look at the scores for uh, help provided for feelings of anxiety or sadness, 65, again, across the board without much of a change. Or training uh, provided about pain medicine side effects, definitely yes, in the 60s. So again, pretty poor performance in that way. As you start to think about, well, how do I, how do I, how do I get change? How do I ch get my organization to change, uh, that starts to ask the question of what are, what are my opportunities? So I'm gonna turn it over to Danielle, and she's gonna talk a little bit about what the opportunities are, how to think about quality uh, in your organizations as you're trying to make those improvements. Can I just have an opportunity to get into the while we talk? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. So um, we really have two parallel challenges here, thank you, in starting to look at hospice quality. One of them is dealing with what we have and how do we continue to get better at that? And one of them is dealing with, well, where do we think we're gonna go? What is the, the question that came up earlier? Well, what, what's CMS's next step here and how do we get potentially involved in that, ideally ahead of that? So I'm gonna start with where we are now and that um, what do we do within our own agencies to manage the, the quality measures that we currently have? And I want to point out here, the most basic model of, of healthcare quality comes in three categories, structure, process, outcomes. Anybody familiar with these, these three categories, right? It, it brings it down to this sometimes oversimplified, but a really nice way to think about what am I working with here? And the idea of the structure of our organizations informing the processes that we engage in that both come together to give us the outcomes. And that we can take this circle from wherever we're starting and go in either direction to help inform us or look for opportunities to improve things or adjust things. It also gives us questions to ask when we start to say, well, what are we gonna do now, Ollie? Right, We're getting a D in some of these CAP surveys. What are we gonna do now, Ollie? So if that's the outcome we're starting from, we can start to move that backwards and say, what are the processes that may be feeding into that outcome? What are the structures that we have organizationally that are pushing us towards that process? Um, and that the interplay of those things gives us an opportunity to say, what can I affect change on? Which point in the process do I think is gonna get me the most likely improvement in my outcome, all right? So we start to look at these things as a collective whole and then break them down in our improvement processes and ask ourselves, is the outcome where we wanna be? Because that's usually where we start from, right? Is this what we want? Is it our goal? And if the answer is no, then we have to start to ask ourselves, okay, within our processes that got to this, does everybody know what to do? Can they do it most of the time? Um, and what are the structures that support them from an infrastructure to be able to do the process? So I, I will tell you my own um, embarrassing story. And there are <laughs> team members here from, from when I worked in Iowa um, who will attest to Danielle's embarrassing story. So I'm a structure process quality person, right? and um, was pushing really, really hard on my team to adopt real-time documentation, particularly ahead of HIS and ahead of these new timelines that were really radically new when we first started doing them, right? So I was pushing really, really hard. Okay, team, you gotta use, your, use those laptops you've got. Make sure you're doing real-time charting. Please don't be charting at midnight. You deserve to go to sleep. All, every, every possible reason that I could come up with to say you should do real-time charting because I was looking at the outcome. What I kind of forgot to ask about was, is the infrastructure supportive? We were months into this, months, and finally, one of our senior nurses on the team hesitantly, big group meeting we're in, there's probably 40 people in this room. And there I am going, we gotta do this team. Why aren't we doing this? Why isn't this moving? And she finally went, um, do you know that the laptops we have are five years old? And I went, um, well, no, I've only been here two years. And she said, well, do you know what that means? I said, no. She said, a lot of the batteries are dead. The cords are fraying. When we go into patients' homes, we can't always find a plug. So sometimes we have to decide between crawling on the floor and unplugging the lamp or plugging in our laptops. And since we are in the process of buying new laptops, IT stopped buying replacement batteries so we can't get any of those. And I went, oh, okay, I'll, I'll deal with that first. My point here is that structure informs process and that both of those things have to be part of our conversation. The point is also that you don't know what you don't know. Um, and if that nurse hadn't been finally brave enough, I would have continued to beat my head against that wall, never ever 
actually engaging in the real problem, which was, um, guys, we still have to buy batteries. I know we're looking to save some money to buy the new laptops, but we actually need the batteries too, right? Um, so this whole circle, the structure process outcome circle, is really, really important, and the two can the, these cannot actually be separated. So when we look at the HIS right now, these are really what we are also calling process measures, right? So you can measure at different points in the structure process outcomes, and the question that was already raised is what's really the outcome in hospice? Well, that's the golden and elusive unicorn because I sit in a lot of conversations with a lot of technical expert panels and CMS contractors and, frankly, amazingly intelligent people, all of whom sit around the table and say, well, we have to figure out how, what's quality in hospice. And then it goes really quiet. It's really hard. So HIS is starting, but we're starting with process measures. We're starting with the I did it, right? Did you assess pain? It's a kind of a yes, no. Does the patient have a bowel regime to go when, when they're on opioids? It's a yes, no, right? It's really the process measure. So part of my point here is that it's much easier to achieve success with the process measures, which the data showed us, right? We can do a lot to help our teams be successful with seven I did it. Where it's going to get more complicated is when those seven I did it become one or two outcomes. So this lead up time that we have in hospice, I would advocate is really, really important for us to get good at our how do we do quality and not so much hung up on the specific item, but investing our time organizationally looking at how do we manage quality as a process, as an idea, as a part of our daily being and not be looking at, okay, good job. I got 99% on my HIS. I'm done with this quality thing. Use this as practice, because those items are going to change. And the, the positive curve that we saw with those um, going up over time, that's excellent. That means we are learning how to do this. So please don't get too excited that you've mastered those seven items. I guarantee you they're changing. Um, it's also more complicated when we come back into the hospice cap survey. Well, for two reasons. One, caps is really an outcome, right? It's not a simple, I did it. And particularly when we look at the items where in general we are struggling is a lot of those training and education questions. That's where we're getting our Ds. But I've got a whole paycheck I'll put on the table that at most of your organizations, if I pull most of your patient records, most of the time I'm going to find charting that says I did do those things, right? Your teams are probably going, what are you talking about? I talk about pain meds all the time, right? How could they possibly give us this score? So it's much more complicated when we start to look at an outcome than when we look at a process measure. And the second part is what was already brought up today, is that this isn't the patient anymore. It's the only place in the entire universe of patient experience surveys where we're not actually asking the patient. Um, I'm sure if someone figures out how we can do that, we will, but as of yet, we can't talk to them anymore. So we have to rely on the people who are left standing. And I want to make a really, um, a lot of emphasis on this point because it is simultaneously one of the hugest challenges we are going to have in the hospice world, it is also one of the most important. I'm gonna ask you to think for a minute. When you tell people what do you do for a living, what's the most common response you get? I don't know about you, but most often I get one of two things. Oh, that's so depressing, how can you do that? Or more often I hear, I love hospice, my fill in the blank loved one was cared for by hospice. That's the patient experience. That's why we ask the survivor. They will remember everything that happens. My father died seven years ago. I can still tell you every minute of it, good and bad, particularly those last few hours. This is what we remember. So when we are doing these, 
when we're getting in those 60%, we have to remember that there are human beings walking around feeling like they failed their loved one because they didn't have the knowledge to do whatever it is that they were being asked to do. And when we look at it that way, I think it takes on a whole new sense of urgency, particularly for our frontline clinicians who are so desperately invested in taking care of those people. Um, I just encourage you to really try and connect your teams to this data that when you turn a 66 or a 72 or an 85 into, well, 15 out of 100 people didn't get the best that you wanted them to get, there's suddenly a huge new investment in, wait, I want all of my patients to have that. We all know that, right? Our clinicians really are in there for the right reasons. So when we start to look at these lowest items, these are the same items from that earlier slide. I just took the numbers off so we didn't get lost in them. There's a couple of these in here that, I'm sorry, they're low-hanging fruit, folks. Family kept informed about when hospice team would arrive. I'll tell you the truth, I thought that was just my team not doing that one so well. Turns out it's everybody. Really? Now, we have some connection to who's going to fill these out. We don't know who's actually going to fill out the survey, but we do know which member of the family is in the pool to get the survey. So we have the ability to connect within our teams who's the person I really need to make sure I talk to because they are the person who's on the list to get the survey later. That should be the primary caregiver. This, this in theory, fits together and it shouldn't be complicated for us to say, well, I'm calling the wife, but daughter Mary's getting the survey. It's supposed to flow, right? So why are we struggling with keeping the family informed about when we're coming? That's one I really don't understand. I would also point out it's pretty much a process measure. It's an I did it. So how are we setting up the structures in our organizations to be successful with that process? How are we helping our teams to prioritize that communication? How are we using this language when we call people or when we leave the lab pre one visit, planning for the next visit, do we use words like, I will be seeing you, I will arrive next time, in a purposeful way? What are the structural components? Does your team go out with everybody's phone number in their easy access, right? So, you can start to break some of these down, and I would advocate you actually break them down from the top down because we've got the simpler ones up the top. Keeping people informed about when we're coming. I'm going to throw out there, we likely run into problems when our schedules change because we're in one house and something is happening, and we don't get to the phone to call patient two or three. So what can we do organizationally to try and engage in that? Do we utilize the folks that we know somewhere in your organization, someone sitting at a desk because their job is about being at that desk? Can we help our clinical people to make one phone call? And that person in your organization then makes two or three more phone calls to inform other people. You know, those are the types of process improvements you can make by looking at your structure. These get a lot more complicated, right? When we start to move into these ones here about um, was there help provided for constipation? Was there help provided for anxiety or sadness? And then the ones about training. I just personally hate that word, so I'm going to say education. But they talk about training. These are looped things, right? Because we're talking about trouble for constipation, and then we're talking about the side effects of the pain medicine. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> They're together. So how are we talking about those things? How often are we talking about those things? Who's talking about those things? Here's a radical idea. D 
do your aides know how to talk about those things? Hospice is the whole interdisciplinary team, right? Does every single person who goes into that house have the ability to reinforce, yes, you want to take your Dulcolax because you're taking your pain medicine, and that means you'll poop better. If this is left to just your nurse, who only makes a certain percentage of the contacts with the family, we're probably not going to move that score very much. So when we start to look at some of these more complicated ones, we have to expand that circle of what is the process and the structure. How do we engage when the social worker goes in? How do we engage with our spiritual care people? help provided for feelings of anxiety or sadness. But we rocked it out of the park on the question about support for our spiritual needs. How can we link these things together, together in a more successful manner? And some of it is, frankly, how specifically are, are our teams using this language? We may be doing a fabulous job of sitting down and connecting with family members and having a cup of coffee and helping them to actually relax, but did they know that that's what you just did? Or did they think that you were just a nice person who was so generous and took an extra 10 minutes, right? It's okay for our teams to take ownership for what they're doing and to be able to say to people, I hope you feel more relaxed now. I'm worried about you because you're anxious. Could we sit down and have a cup of coffee together? If we're articulating that that's what we're actually doing, would these scores move? I don't know, I haven't tested it. But my point here is that you can think about the structure and the process of a lot of different components to get to these outcomes. I also want to tell you my personal favorite. Anybody do leader rounding? <laughs> leader rounding is so fabulous. I have to give credit where credit's due. I didn't come up with this. This is Quint Studer. He wrote this book, I don't know, probably over 10 years ago now. I'm getting old. It might be 15. <laughs> but what this idea talks about is how the engagement of a front, a front level leader directly with the patient has a massive, massive impact. And this I can also tell you as a point of pride from previous life, that when the leaders actually show up in people's houses and say, hi, I'm Danielle, I'm the team leader or the team manager or the office director or whatever their title is, and I just came here to visit with you and see how you're doing. Right there, satisfaction went up. Family experience went up. Just from having the sense that, oh, I'm so important to boss key. That's really, really, really valuable. And when that leader is also purposely engaged and aware of my action going out there is part of improving the experience of the survivor, not just the score. It's really about helping that family member to have a more positive experience, to be more comfortable with their end of life. You actually get better scores. So I will tell you, um, one, it is evidence-based. Two, it's a huge structural commitment because you have to make time in their busy days to actually go out and do this. That means they get windshield time, too. Um, but it's role modeling. And it starts with them doing things like, does the chart match the patient? This is a huge multi-benefit strategy. How does your leader evaluate your team? How does your leader help them develop? How does your leader find ways to support them? How does your leader know who to congratulate? And who should be held up as a role model and to emulate? Well, this is one great way. Read the chart before you go, and then go in the house. Did you see what you thought you were going to see? Did you, were you able to say to patients, I saw last week that our spiritual care person came out. How was that visit for you? Do you know what you just said to that patient? 
You just told that patient how much they matter. You just told that family member that this whole team is really paying attention to us. It's very, very powerful. The leader continues this whole cycle of keeping everybody engaged, helping you to move whatever your quality initiatives are at that point. If you're all working on let's call patients before we go out, the leader going out gets to follow up on that, gets to have the chance to say you guys are doing a good job because every patient I saw this week knew when you were coming next. That's a really powerful, positive intervention to keep people moving forward. Um, it's also about really role modeling the new behavior. If you're trying to break people into, okay, now we're going to you know, give green pens instead of blue ones when we admit patients, well, the leader getting out there going, here's green pens, that will help people to adopt the new green pen policy. A core point in all of this is that quality is about reliability and it's about sustainability, right? If we implement green pens and then forget that we actually can't get any more green pens after we go through the stockpile that we have, it's not sustainable. So why are you bothering to do that? As I said before, HIS is gonna change, but measuring something isn't. Hospice is gonna measure stuff. Trust me, what we're going to measure, mm, it's not going to be those seven. Trust me when I tell you the people at CMS are already tired of those seven. They are, uh, knew from the get-go they weren't the ultimate. Learning how we do quality as a process and how we talk about the structure, the process, the outcomes, where do we look for opportunities, how do we break it down, how do we engage with strategies like leader rounding that give us multiple opportunities to continue to improve, that's where you're going to see the big bang for your buck. That's where you're going to see the commitment to quality that means you can manage whatever outcome ends up being the measurement point because your team's ready for it and you're ready for it. Um, when you're doing quality, remember a couple key things. You're talking about human behavior change. That's not easy. If it were, no one would have smoked a cigarette after 1972, right? Humans don't like to change their behavior. It is about adopting behavior change whenever you're talking about this. So be patient. Try and be as clear as you can. Because if you can't explain what the heck you're asking people to do, they can't possibly do it, right? Um, so you need to be able to identify your structure and your process in a way that you can share and articulate and make sure people can give back to you because if they don't even understand where you're going, there's no way you're gonna be successful with this. And try and look at outcomes in a usable way, right? We talked before about how sometimes it's difficult to access, yeah, so we see our patient satisfaction survey numbers, and it's, you know, 72, and people go, oh yeah, 72, that's not bad, right? That's pretty good. 85, that's great, I'm getting a B, I'm good, yeah. Okay, but let's really talk about what 85 means, because it means there's 15 people out of every 100 who didn't get what you wanted them to have. Now you have accessible outcomes data. Now you have people who understand in their heart and soul what those numbers mean. That's when you're gonna see people commit to what do I do differently. I know I moved through that kind of fast, but I really wanna get here. Because we want to talk about not just what you can be doing on an organizational level, but also where do we think CMS is going to go and how do we collectively engage in that conversation because there are opportunities. So we talked about the new composite measure coming and the hospice visits when death is imminent. We're already into those, right? So those aren't anything new. But this comes back to the comment of earlier. CMS wants all of the quality programs to promote the delivery of person-centered, high quality, and safe care by hospices in this instinct, instance. 
CMS wants to, has sought to adopt measures recommended by multi-stakeholder organizations. So those are those technical expert panels and you know when you read your member update and says, hey, there's a call for nominations, you can nominate your own people. Because some of you are just, you know, raise your hand. It's kind of fun to sit there. Um, and here's the really important part that the quality programs are designed to compare performance between hospices. So it requires the data is collected in a standardized and uniform manner so we can compare apples to apples because at the end of the day, this program is about comparing you side by side. And that is really where we're going with Hospice Compare. Chris pointed out earlier that if you go back historically and look at Home Care Compare, the data was pretty much the same as it is with hospice. Stable as a rock. Didn't move, didn't move. And then guess what? CMS got tired of it not moving. Now we have value-based purchasing in nine states. It moved. It's moving. So how about we take advantage of the fact that hospice is the caboose in this storyline and understand that, you know what? We can wait until they put money behind it or we can jump out ahead and be the five-star place before they start putting the money there. Wouldn't it be nice if we were all the five-star places, which now comes back to his comment again. You're like a plant in the audience. Um, so we already know the composite measure is lacking variance right now, which means it doesn't give us a good opportunity to compare one person to another or one agency to another, and that is a challenge. Um, this idea, death is imminent, mm -hmm, right? That's the whole point of this. So it brings us to these conversations, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, oh, um, about what is the point of quality in hospice? How do we say, well, okay, if the whole, like, a trusted goal is that the person at the center of this is going to die. What does that mean? And how do we possibly wrap our arms around it in some way to measure that outcome? Because what, occasionally someone gets discharged alive, but really not. So we can't just measure the act of being alive or dead. That's not the outcome as it is sometimes in hospitals. We talk about mortality from a lot of things, but it's not gonna help us here. We talk about hospice quality as being around a good death, right? Death with dignity. What does that mean? That's the golden unicorn. I'm telling you, we are all chasing the golden unicorn. Um, these measures, though, are going to be out there for public reporting, and they are going to keep pushing on them. And there's going to continue to be thought around what those measures are. That's why we saw the addition of the death with imminent. Who's getting visits? I don't personally think that's a big stretch, right? If we're supposed to be caring for people at the end of life, shouldn't we actually be there at the end of their life? Some of you are going, well, yeah, yeah, right? So I don't know what comes next, but something's coming. Um, so now we get into this, when is an A not an A? <laughs> this is some of the stuff that um, Chris and I have some fun discussing. And these ideas of, can everyone have an A? So, I don't know how we're gonna do two mics, one, <laughs> but, this brings us into um, if everybody's scores are really high, is that okay? And what does that mean to us from an organizational perspective, right? And isn't it good that we're all up there? I mean, th this is really, do I have a pointer on here? Yep. I do? Ha ha, look at that. That's 97.5 to 100%. Who's thrilled when their kids bring home that score? Right? So is it okay that everybody gets an A? 
That's a great question. And you know, so I think we looked at the scores of the composite measure. That's what this is. And if you remember, the average was around 90. Um, but when you look at this, the median is close to a 93. Uh, so that's really this question of, you know, what's the best way to kind of look at quality when you have a lot of scores at that top end? Sometimes people talk of these scores as being topped out a little bit. Um, you know, I was looking just, um, just this afternoon, I was trying to recall one of the process measures in uh, home care um, is about, um, you know, training on oral meds. And if you got a score uh, of a 98.5, you would be three star, a three star at 98.5 uh, to 99. Um, so you have to sit there and you go, well, wait a second, that's pretty good quality. I, if this was a, uh, you know, any other kind of industry, I'd say that's, that's a pretty good score. I would go there, I would use that. So, so when you start talking about the star ratings, you know, it really begs the question, what's the right methodology to determine what is a quality agency? And again, we've got process measures right now along with the, with the CAPS outcomes. And you know, we have to start asking that question, what is it? And it brings us to this debate about what's the point here, right? And I think as clinicians, we want to say, yes, this is great. That means everybody who's choosing hospice care in the country is really having a positive experience. It's very healthy for them. It's very peaceful. We are achieving that elusive um, good death. But um, that's not really the point of hospice compare, is it? Because there is a simple reality here that we have multiple purposes for collecting quality. We would like, I'm just going to call it out, as clinicians to cheer each other on, particularly in hospice, and say, this is fabulous. It's what we all joined hospice to do. But I have a hard time imagining that the people paying for it who have already realized that hospice is no longer budget dust and are now paying attention to it are actually going to be really thrilled that everybody does a great job. I, I don't think that's consistent with what we've seen in other areas of healthcare. So this is a couple of reasons why, one, it's not going to stay stable. And two, it brings up the issues around how they do methodology, which I guess we've actually run out of time before we get, can get into. But some of the things about the STAR measures are about how they're calculated. Are they calculating them to make um, a, that standard bell curve, right? Where you've got most people with a three stars and a couple with four and two and some with five and one? Or, and that has to be even? Because I don't really know how that's going to happen out of this. Alternatively, they're using a method in some of the other stars where they're doing what's called clustering. And that just gets super, super confusing. But what you could see out of this is that it's going to be a challenge. The statisticians at CMS are going to look at this and go, I don't know what we can make stars out of this with. Because otherwise, they're either going to have to accept a whole ton of people get five stars or they're going to have to change these measures, right? Yeah, because, you know, I, I, we, we live in Bay City where I live in Grant, and one of the things that always gets me is when you have a process measure, what you're just really looking at is you have standard performance. The bigger question, which is an infinitely harder equation, is did that standard behavior make a difference, difference. in the outcome from the Mm -hmm. and that's what we struggle with throughout Yep. And I, and I would suggest for consideration that in hospice at least, because I'm sitting at those tables and when it gets to, well, how are we going to measure an outcome, the room goes quiet, right? But what we do have is the experience surveys. And the experience surveys have variability and they are an outcome. Let's say as compared to traditional home care, 
is the structure and process as mandated around hospitals a contributor to this kind of result? You don't have the kind of structure and process requirements for home care that you have in hospice in terms of um, the, you know, having to introduce certain kinds of services, the, the kind of team-based care planning and communication that has to take place. All of those things could very well be contributing mm -hmm. in actuality to a, a, a real higher level of satisfaction among patients and families with this particular healthcare experience. Um, I so think it might be useful mm -hmm. also for them to back into and look at some of the things that might be driving this that you don't see in other areas of the health So you actually introduced one of the things that, that Chris and I had wanted to talk about was this idea of how you collect the data. Um, and that right now what we're doing in hospice is abstracting. Right? Someone in your team sits with the chart, abstracts key information, and then sends it away. Whereas in home care, there's the OASIS tool, right? So that's a standardized assessment tool that is really deep. Is it everything in the world? No, don't get me wrong, it's not. But it is a standardized assessment tool that doesn't have the abstracting. And there is absolutely conversation in the CMS world, particularly as we move into Impact Act and trying to look at the um, post-acute providers, I put that in quotes because I hate that phrase, conversation for another day, um, but taking those four settings of care and trying to standardize their assessment tools in order to compare an inpatient rehab to a SNF to a long-term care hospital to home health care. Well, now we've got hospice on the side, and believe me, they know it. And there is a conversation going on about Hmm, should there be a standardized assessment tool in hospice? So I put that out there as an opportunity for us to start thinking about, do we want to advocate for something? Do we have things that we would want to see included? You guys know hospice care best. And there are opportunities for a technical expert panel. There are opportunities to develop quality. Chris and I are talking about how we develop quality in hospice. You guys are the ones. Um, and the conversation we had in the last session was about which data are we going to look at? And how do you manage clinical knowledge with data? Well, you're the clinicians. So you're the ones who are most likely to be able to give an idea or a direction or an understanding of this is what a good death looks like. This is how I know I did a good job as a clinician in hospice. And those are the things that really should be informing this kind of data. And then they have to be married with the simple realities of who's paying. So I'd love to live in the clinical world and just go, hey, let's all just work together and hold hands and do the best we can for patients. Still need to get paid, though. Right? So how are we going to marry those conversations? And it, to me, it's very exciting because hospice is so different than home care. Home care is in a different place. It's a very different conversation where we have to try and help people undo things they think they know. Hospice, nobody knows anything. So <laughs> we get to engage in this conversation. And I really, I know we're out of time, and I appreciate that you guys are, are sitting here a few minutes longer. But how do you take what you know? How do you go back to your clinicians and say, hey, guys, how do you know when you actually feel good? Because as a person who chose hospice, you know when that death was peaceful. How do you know that? and then feed that backwards because that answer is what we want to figure out how to measure. It's what I would advocate because this isn't going to fly in a value-based purchasing world. So we can keep our heads down for a while longer, but not too much. <laughs> Chris, I'm... 
walking and talking. <laughs> yes, no, and you're doing a great job. And I know we're at the end uh, here, but you know, what's, what's compelling um, about how we're going to think about quality kind of came up a little bit today uh, in the plenary session uh, when Alec uh, talked about Providence. And he said, if you're not a three star or better agency, you're not coming into my hospital. So as we think about star ratings, as we think about, you know, what's quality, we want to make sure we get it right because it's going to have an impact in the way we look at um, our relationships with other parties, other parts of the continuum. So I think that's going to be pretty important. It was, that was kind of telling to me as I was thinking about our presentation. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that, you know, are yet to come, and I think with your help uh, in terms of thinking this through, I think a lot about patient preference, uh, what's important about symptom control um, in terms of what is quality. Uh, but how do, you, how do you record that? How do you make that part uh, of that abstract, as a part of that uh, a new assessment tool that they're talking about? So there's a, there's a lot to come. Um, and hopefully, we've given you a couple things to think about. Um, you know, and we do appreciate um, you being here today to, to kind of listen to us. So thank you for that. Thanks, Bill. And go to the reception because there's food and drink.